Uh, Gert, really, it's a pleasure for, uh, for us to, be, to have you uh, in our convention. And uh, but the challenge is to share the, the view of the future of the technology, and specifically in this community working on different space of the digital infrastructure. So the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. <laughs> Bonjour à tous. Uh, J'habite à Bal. And this will be the only French I will give you. Um, I could try to present in French, but it would be very ugly, uh, even more ugly than in German. So I will present to you in, in English. Uh, if I speak too fast, please wave. Okay. Uh, I lived in America for 17 years, and in America, if you don't speak fast, you don't get to say anything. So uh, I learned a few things. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation to Jean-Luc and, and the whole organization. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in the, in the country of uh, Jacques Attali, uh, one of the original futurists. Uh, there's a few people who have inspired my work, and one of them was Alvin Toffler, which you may know, Peter Drucker, who was in his own right a futurist, and the other one is, is uh, Jacques Attali. There are a lot of changes in France right now. It's very interesting to watch. Uh, living in Basel, we're basically in France, you know, five kilometers, or we go for dinner in France. So we, uh, we have a lot of overlap there. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the future of technology. If you are on Twitter, I think Twitter is somewhat popular in France as well. I am G. Leonhardt on Twitter. I don't have a French feed. I will start one very soon, though. Um, if you're on Twitter, I'm G. Leonhardt. Just follow me. Uh, just give you a sort of a brief idea of what a futurist actually does. If you never met a live futurist, I think the French word la prospective, or le prospective in this case it would be, uh, is, is a good word for this. Uh, I try to share foresights. So we're not predicting anything. We're basically taking the time to look what's happening around the world. I have a company of about 25 people that are future agents, like, uh, you know, agents essentially, like a small army. And then we try to help people to develop business models to reinvent what they are doing. Um, here are some of our clients actually missing as good. There's about 100 clients from all over the world, technology companies like Google to others like uh, publishers. Gaston Berger, another French futurist, says, the purpose of looking at the future is to disturb the present. So my wish for you tonight, uh, this afternoon, as I'm speaking for you, I would, I would like to disturb you. Because in the end, you know, if, uh, if we don't feel disturbed and worried about what's happening, we probably won't be doing anything. So these are actually very good times of change because there's a lot of disruption and disturbance right now on, on a global level. Just uh, two days ago, there was a Twitter storm, a Twitter activity about the Rio 20 and the climate change issue that caused over 10 million tweets to go on per hour about climate change. So we have a huge amount of activities of disruption and we're entering the area, I think, of leaps. On this website, um, I haven't used it, it's... Uh, What is it called again? Sorry about that. I haven't used it. I, th I think it's called 23andMe.com. Um, you can have your DNA analyzed for $300. This used to cost $100,000. Pretty soon it'll be $50 to get your DNA analyzed. Uh, we're seeing the use of social media and revolutions. Uh, we're seeing disruption and leaps in all different ways. I work in Indonesia for Telkom Indonesia, and they're putting all of the islands online And these are people who never had radio or television before. Now they can use the mobile phone to watch YouTube. Think about the kind of leap and disruption that we're going to see, not just in Europe, but on a global level. That reminds me of Mr. Spock. Uh, many of you are in the right age to know Mr. Spock, of course. And what he has in his hand is the tricorder. You know, it's a machine that can heal people and make an analysis of your disease instantly and fix it. Uh, and just last year, there was a, uh, an organization called the XPRIZE in the U.S. that have put $30 million dollars into the creation of a real tricorder. The mission is to be better than a team of doctors for the analysis of your disease. So you have a pricking device. You prick your finger, you sneeze into it, you have a recorder of your pulse, and it tells you what you have. Okay, that's the mission. So you can say that's ridiculous, right? How can anybody think that it's going to replace a doctor? Obviously not, right? But it does have its purpose. It's a mind-boggling pace of technology. Um, but really useful ideas must change our habits, not just the tech. And this is really where the habits are. That's you know, where we get into politics and, of course, 
you know, if we're looking at what's happening with kids today, uh, clearly you can see that kids, kids that are used to the iPad will be looking to Zoom a magazine. Right? Uh, this is what the, the change of interface has already happened with kids that they think this is broken, like the magazine is broken because they can't Zoom like an iPad. Um, so habits are changing very quickly and every screen that we have around us is becoming some sort of connected television or radio. I mean, go in the taxi, and mostly in London or in Hong Kong or, or somewhere like that, you see the taxi driver with five different screens, you know, Facebook, the social network, Weibo in China, the map, the Google map, the iPhone, five different things are sucking up to the screen. So there are screens everywhere and they're all connected. Uh, Ericsson anticipates we'll have 55 billion devices connected to global machine-to-machine -machine network in the next five years. Think about all the opportunities and, of course, all of the challenges that we have because of this connected televisions, radios, readers. Imagine this device, this is the one laptop per child, costs less than, than $5 to make, a tablet device. Imagine this in the hand of 5 billion people who can read, who can vote, who can learn stuff, right? who can put their health records online. And that is going to change the world, of course, in Europe, you know, where we're much more, you know, we've already gone through a lot of these things. But in developing countries, this will be 3 billion people in those countries doing this. So what will this do for us? But by, uh, by 2017, you can see in this interesting chart is that 56% of Nigerians are already going online using mobile networks. By 2017, we can expect about 50 to 75% of all media consumption to be on mobile devices. Basically, what that means today is that if you're not mobile, if your company isn't mobile, if your radio station isn't mobile, if your television station isn't mobile, if your band isn't mobile, it will probably go away. It will be irrelevant. If you own a radio station today, then you have to look at technology, what, how that will change the way you will go forward. We'll have over-the-top content I'm sure that's a big term here in France as well. Direct television that you can watch, like TED.com and others. We'll have a $250 billion advertising market supporting those new business models, digital business models, in the next five years. And you can say, well, that's all far away, but it's actually happening very, very quickly now. And, and the pace is happening all over the world, led by, ultimately, China. So we'll see a lot of business models coming this way. We're seeing a convergence of things that were previously not together. Uh, one of them, of course, being search and social, television and the internet. And this is the kind of stuff, you know, I was in the internet business in the 90s, and we talked about this every day and said, oh, it's going to happen next week. Well, it didn't happen and we all died, of course, because it was too early. But it's here now. The television and the internet is the same thing now. The television is connected to the internet. The computer is connected to the mobile. We're not really ever really offline, except for mentally. We're always connected. So when you think about this, for example, if you're in a telecom business, some of you may be in a telecom business, SMS has a good chance of dying. Because when you have a data plan and you're always on, why do you want to use SMS? There's no point. Right? You can use other tools. It's convenient. It works. It's a habit, yes. but That's $300 million a day for the telecom operators that are up for grabs. That could very likely go away. So think about that convergence, some real challenges, tele telemedia convergence, television converging with the guys who run this. A $3.7 trillion industry converging with a $1 trillion industry. We had this here in France, of course, with Orange and Deezer, which uh, is a streaming service. I'd, we've seen those things in Orange Television, of course. Uh, France, in fact, has been very much on the cutting edge of this very trend telemedia. But what we're seeing here is that these previous silos, I think this is very important if you're a startup, if you're in the business of creating new things, if you're innovating, we're no longer in those places sitting separately next to each other. That was an easy time. You know, if you were successful being a telco, you didn't need to worry about the content guys. No matter what they did, it didn't matter. You weren't responsible, didn't matter. But now it's basically that business model of silos is game over. The content guys can't do without the telecoms to develop new business models, and they can't do without the advertising people. So we're entering a world that I call an ecosystem. Not in the sense of green, but in the sense of connected. Okay? Technology is no longer in a silo. If you're in the technology business, you're in the content business, and vice versa, you're in the advertising business, you're also in the business of devices. 
And here's a guy named Michio Kaku, who's a acclaimed physicist and, and futurist, and he tells us what we have to do to be ready for the future. Uh, the key word is reimagining, reimagining what we do. I work for car companies that are clearly saying, you know what, in five years it's quite clear that people will be using self-driving cars, electric self-driving cars. Why would I buy a Lamborghini if I'm going to not drive myself? Right? I mean, this is a substantial change to the business model all across them. They have to reimagine their business. Check out this video. The future, the internet is going to be in our contact lens. And when the internet is in our contact lens, you blink and you will go online. And if you meet somebody at a meeting, a conference, or a classroom, and you don't know who they are, your glasses will identify who they are and print out their biography in your contact lens. So you will always know who you are talking to. At a cocktail party, you will always know who to suck up to if you're looking for a job. This could be very useful, but I mean, clearly, this is a very strange society if this is true. Right? In Japan, you can already go to a dating bar and you can scan the face of the woman or the, or the man that you're dating, and the, the social network information comes up on top of the profile, and you can decide if you want to proceed or not. Right? That would not be socially acceptable in France or, or, or in Switzerland, or maybe in some places, I don't know. <laughs> but certainly, this is a huge really change. Right? We're moving now in a world that was governed by television. Some of you may have some connections to television. A world where we spend five or six hours a day on wasting time on television, and where television lied to us a lot more than the internet ever has. Right? Weapons of mass destruction. Right? I mean, that world of broadcasting is becoming a world of what I call broadbanding. And so, cloud-based systems. And conversation. Right? Interaction. And they're actually not replacing each other. And that's the scary part. I mean, if it was easy, it was just all moving in one direction. Right? But broadcasting will be there. Big broadcasters will be there, but they have to adopt all these pieces of a new food chain that's currently governed by Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and what have you. That's inevitable. Because, you know, to be frank, a lot of these places have only utter garbage, right? I mean, it's, it's noise, right? It's basically a huge amount of noise that we don't know what to do about. So we need the old guys to figure this out, how to filter, right, to, to make sense out of this. I mean, clearly, you need both. And, and this is a huge opportunity if you're in the startup space to help the media companies and the telecom companies figure out this problem. Intelligent software, recommendations, artificial intelligence, comparison, right? protection through social DRM and the, all those kind of things. Right? It's a huge business area. So personally, I'm, I think uh, because you know, you're obviously in the business of innovation here, um, you're living through a very, very lucky time. Ten, ten years ago, the internet really wasn't that fruitful. You know, it wasn't really like, it was there, but it wasn't really usable. Now, all of a sudden, we've made this huge leap into social, into local, where we can go into a mall and get a coupon from, from the store to, to buy something or, or not buy something. Mobile, the cloud, the video. 85% of the top 1,000 companies in the world have a video channel where they communicate in video about their new product. Video is about to become the number one thing on the network. So, uh, Kleiner Perkins, the lead investor in Facebook, who is actually making some money with the IPO. I hope he didn't buy any Facebook shares. Eh? But uh, anyway, I don't elaborate on this. But they came up with this, uh, this uh, tagline, solo mo, social local mobile. And if you want to know the future in a nutshell, that's the future. Social, local, and mobile, not the computer. Right? The internet on the computer is dead. So in this situation, there is us, you know, that's all of us. We're in the cloud doing stuff, recommending things, saying, yes, I like this, I, I'm turning left here, I'm going here, I'm coming from this website, and so on. So in this world, you can truly say that the consumers are the show. I mean, who is the show on Facebook? There, there's no show on Facebook. We are the show of Facebook, and we are also the show of YouTube. That's why some people say that Facebook is a perpetual virtual reality show, which is very true. Right? If we stop playing the show, then there is no show. Facebook is dead, because they're not MTV. So we are the show. That's sort of the next five years. And again, all of a sudden, we become a lot more important and much more powerful. And in a way, you could say what happened, for example, in technology or so, that you had 
you know, big guys chasing, chasing the small guys, and now this is reverting where there's millions of small guys chasing the big guys. Of course, it's not either or, it's both. But imagine if you're this guy here. This does not feel very good because, you know, basically, no matter how you look at it, the world isn't going to be the same. You don't have the same monopoly position in a good or bad way. Just look at the music business where I worked for 10 years. They have shrunk 72% in the decade by essentially telling the users that they couldn't have what they wanted. I mean, we've seen, of course, in this country, I won't mention the Hadopi word. <laughs> Maybe I will mention it, but didn't go anywhere. I don't know what your opinion is on this, but certainly hasn't created any money, except for the lawyers, maybe. But so now we have this issue to where all of a sudden things are becoming open. For example, APIs, right? We're living in a world of APIs. Every company has application platform interfaces connecting with each other, and they're realizing that they're giving authority to others. Twitter runs 4,250 companies are sitting on top of the Twitter API. If Twitter says, API is closed, over. Right? We're living now in a world of interdependence. We see that with the, with the Euro and the Greeks. Right? We see that with global warming and oil. Right? We're living in a world of interdependence. And we may not enjoy it, because you know, being independent is easier. Right? But we're living in a world of interdependence. Also, you know, we're living in a world of new powers. You know, we can bleed data. We can make fools of ourselves on the internet. We can use Facebook to express our opinions. We have to learn new responsibilities, especially, I think, in Europe. You know, we're not very fast with adopting new, new habits. But we have to learn new responsibilities. And there's many first-time things that are happening, the virtual handshake of data. I don't think we need regulation to tell us, at this point, what the definitive rule for the future is. We just have to discuss the process of how we're going to find out what is best for us and when and how. And there has to be some sort of standard, clearly. Just like there's a standard, you, you don't go to the bar naked. Right? You, you wear a suit when you go to the bar, whatever you do at the bar, but you, there's a standard of what you do there. Right? So being naked in cyberspace, you know, being transparent is a, is a huge challenge. And just imagine that this I will be ever present, and this is not Science fiction. If you're using a, car, uh, a, a toll booth device in America to pay for the bridge, this device is always on, right? Because it tracks when you come through to pay, it can track where you go. In theory, uh, if they care to, and I'm sure sometimes they do. Right? So the question is, data mining, what is creepy, as they say in America? You know, it's a good word in French, I don't know. What is bad and what is cool? You can check into the Palms Hotel in Las Vegas, and if your cloud score, your social network score of Twitter, you know, if you're important on Twitter, they will give you a free upgrade. They, they actually look at you on the internet before you check in, and they rate you as being important or not. Whatever the rule is, I don't know. Right. Would you want? We'll skip this. So, one thing, actually, we don't skip this because it's good, is a television that's envisioned by Intel. Intel will make a television that can scan people's faces in the living room and synchronize the ads to who's there. Man, woman, young, old, and whether they're angry or happy. Right. So, eh? Would you watch TV if you knew someone else was watching you? Intel is reportedly planning its own television service. Insiders say it will be a chopped down version of your standard cable service. And it will come to you through a camera equipped set top box that knows who's watching. John Anderson, <laughs> you could use a Guinness right about now. Okay, so it's not going to scan your eyeballs, but it will use proprietary Intel chip tech to determine the gender and age of its current audience. Intel thinks it can provide more accurate. And guess what Intel is saying? It's saying if you set up this box and you let people scan your eyeballs, the TV shows are free. Paying with data. Right? Uh, this is not far-fetched, but this brings up a huge amount of opportunity as well as challenges. I think if you're in the business of data, which is technology is in the business of data almost always, right? there's a huge opportunity for orchestrating what happens with that data. I mean, there's uh, clearly all the leading companies today like eBay and Google and, and so on, they're in the data business. So there's a, a huge opportunity and this is why I think we have to be very careful, especially in Europe, 
that we don't kill the golden goose. We don't make people feel, think that they're always watched by us if we're running advertising because they'll, they'll kick us out. And this is what Facebook has to face, right? If Facebook pushes the border too far, and this is, uh, you may have noticed that General Motors pulled out of Facebook right before they went public. You know why they pulled out? There's an obvious story. Yeah? General Motors said to Facebook, we don't like the ads, they're not big enough. If you don't give us the big ads scrolling all over the page, we're leaving. And Facebook said, we don't care about your big ads because it ruins Facebook if you do that. So go away. And they went away. That's the real reason. So if we don't kill the golden goose, I think then we have a good future as far as the data is concerned. And uh, clearly, you know, there is now an initiative in America called Do Not Track. If this happens, then you can hit, this is my browser, right? My Firefox browser. Tell the website, I don't want to be tracked. There's no cookies or anything. Then advertising is dead. It's $100 billion is dead if this happens. So that's a very sensitive point also for the future of innovation. Clearly, as I said earlier, we're moving now into an interdependent world. If people don't allow us to track them, then we don't have a business selling advertising because it'll be useless. So whatever you're doing in terms of innovation, starting new companies, I think interdependence has to be a goal, not independence. There's very few companies that can do independence like Universal Music or Disney have done in the past or Apple. Apple is the exception for all of these rules, right? It's a super empire run, run by Superman. But if you want to be Superman or ex-Superman, uh, rest in peace, if you want to be Superman, you can give it a try, but I think it's better to uh, focus on a different system. Dropbox, you guys are using Dropbox, yeah? Lots of Dropbox users, I'm sure that's everywhere. Dropbox has a great principle of interdependence. You know what they do is to say, if you tell others about Dropbox, we'll give you extra storage. Give something to get something. That is a principle of a networked society. That is also the principle of commerce of a networked society. And that can sometimes be quite difficult, just like what's called collaborative consumption. You know what the biggest trend is in the car business? Anyone have an idea? It's not the guys in Germany with the connected cars, not those things. Right? It's not to buy a car, but to share a car. Car sharing, peer-to-peer -peer lending of cars, flat rates for taxis, all the car companies knows. If this happens in all the major cities around the world, the business will never be the same. Again, why would you buy an S500 if you're not driving yourself? Or I mean, you can be driven, but then you have to share it. And what's the point? Could be any car then. So Collaborative Consumption, a great book by Rachel Boltzmann. I would recommend that you take a look at it. OK, so we're heading into an era of deep and global disruption. I mean, there's a great report by Ryko. You can download the 80 pages, just Google uh, here, this agent of change report. You know all these things like smartphones and social networks. But we're moving into a time of significant disruption for the next five years in technology, in media, which is becoming, again, the same thing. Disruption often defines success. The light bulb, huh? the eco-friendly light bulb, that's disrupting the way that people, you can hardly see it here. Or the map that's now part of Apple kicked out Google Maps. I, these bloody beginners, like Waze, it's called Waze or Waze or something like that. Right? And of course, TomTom, Tom, it kicked out Google Maps on the iOS. I mean, all this disruption, this is the guy's Waze. Right? This is an app you can download. It's a shared app where people are sharing uh, traffic cameras, which is like a little bit like this thing that you have here in France that every driver uses. I think it's called the Cobalt or something, whatever it is. But you're sharing stuff, right? And, and this is basically coming to a conclusion is, you can either disrupt something or you can be disrupted. And this is true now for, for whatever sector you're in. I mean, basically that's true for sort of a lifestyle promise. You know, you can look for disruption. And this is basically, you know, if I work with startups, I'm always saying, if you're not disrupting anything, what's the point? It's very unlikely you're going to be successful. I mean, finding a mission to disrupt something, basically. Uh, a company in Holland called Layar that do, does augmented reality. They launched two weeks ago an app, an augmented uh, browser that you can hold over a print magazine and it will give you multimedia content to go with what's in the magazine without prepping the magazine. Right? It's called augmented printing. 
And this has the potential to change the entire printing business into a connected business. I mean, you can invent something like this. It's very powerful, you know, I, I don't really know how it actually works. I haven't tried it yet. Uh, but I have tried it in the past, but it looks very promising. So disruptive innovation is really what we're looking for. And a, a lot of that is coming from France, actually, the last five years. It's quite interesting to see that there's a lot of interesting things happening here on a global level. So uh, who knows Sonos? You know, it's a, this is a, uh, an audio company. Yeah, okay, the Sonos fans here. <laughs> okay, Sonos does uh, create an audio system that streams music to any place in the house or wherever you are, you know, in the garden or so, wirelessly. And three years ago, they made a bold move. They said, this little box here on the left was $300, was the controller for the wireless activity in the house. And then they noticed people weren't buying this because it's pretty much a waste of time. That could just be an app. So they went with a free app. They made the decision to drop the sales of a $300 device in their favor of a free app, which turned out to be the lifesaver. Everybody has the app, everybody buys the speakers. And that's really what they want to sell, is the speaking system. Right? So making bold moves, but not stupid moves. That's definitely a recipe for the future. I'm going to skip this because I want to give you some examples. But um, talk about media briefly. This is a huge opportunity. It's the entire media business, which includes gaming, films, television, music, is shifting from a no attitude to a yes attitude. Because guess what? They don't have a choice because the stuff is being used anyway. Digital books, now more books sold on the Kindle than, than in print. In the US and in Europe, I think a little bit less than that still, but it's still also increasing. And what did the publisher say when Amazon came to them with the Kindle? Publisher said, oh, we're, we're gonna charge the same or more than the print. Okay. What did Amazon do? They said, well, never mind, we'll pay one third until you get used to it. And now the prices are dropping. Now clearly, media companies have to shift from no to yes. Uh, they have to think about business models, not legal models. I mean, not legal models in the sense of jurisdiction, right? But in the sense of revenues. And that's happening for newspapers. Uh, in music and others, basically, it's all about access now. It's not about ownership. I mean, you have, many of you may be in the age where we like to collect, like myself, uh, CDs and books. But basically, media is shifting to access. And there's hundreds and hundreds of startups who are working on this very topic, how to make media become an access-based model. That's true for books, for travel, business information, all that kind of content we're thinking. As we can see here, iTunes sales are totally flat in the US and around the world, while streaming is exploding. That's a global phenomenon. This is, of course, explaining the success of Deezer and others. So a friend of mine, a futurist in Australia, has come up with a beautiful chart called the Newscape. And uh, if you are looking to build stuff that works with the, with the media business or the content business, that's basically explaining it all. What has to be done now is to, to add values around the content. So a newspaper adds an interface, like uh, Flipboard. Adds an analysis, the timeliness, the relevance, the filter in the community, like the Huffington Post. Right? The only reason that people love the Huffington Post is because it's social. It's connected with everything else. The only reason I watch CNN is because they use Twitter. They're actually very good at the integration. So building digital service around content is a huge mission. It's also a very fruitful mission because the time is right. You know, it's not 1999 where we already tried this and failed and died. So technologists, the media companies will need serious help to get into the future. This is a huge field and it's becoming really powerful now. All the investment of the past, you know, they has been an investment in about 700 music companies, digital music companies that all died and failed, because right? it wasn't the time. But now it's happening, so this is very good reality, and you're seeing, you know, for example, all people are always saying people don't want to pay for content, don't believe it. Right? I mean, anybody who tells you that people aren't willing to pay for content, it's just not true. They're not willing to do the deal that we're offering them. It's like you know, going out and saying you can, you can eat uh, French fries on the street or you can have them for $250 in the hotel. Well, what are the choices? Right? They'll limit the choices. Look at all the stuff that people are paying for. From Netflix to Hulu to The Economist to The Wall Street Journal. The New York Times, $300 a year. A million subscribers. So people are paying for content. You know, that whole argument that it's not working, I think it's overdue. And I think you know, here in France, also a big discussion about the paywall, I think. 
I think we should flip that and we should say we should do something that I call this the pay will, not the pay wall. Create something that people will pay for. Okay, so I want to share some opportunities with you, and then uh, I think I'm already heading towards my final time here, so I'm going to make it fairly quick. So people are always saying, we'll talk about the future. Let me talk about here and now. Immediate opportunities. First, imagine cable and satellite TV becoming just another app. Imagine France Television being an app on your interactive TV, along with TED.com and, and the YouTube channel. That's our future. And I don't mean just another app in the sense of meaningless. I mean an app as part of the options. That's a huge amount of activity that we're going to see in this overlap of television and the internet. Great business for all kinds of things, recommendation, second screens, mobile devices connecting, and so on and so on. Twitter will become the next CNN. Now you're saying you're sitting here laughing, right? But I'm serious. Right now it's garbage and noise, and only experts can find their way. But that's what's happening with news, real time. 22 seconds to report to us that Whitney Houston has died. How long did that take on television? 54 minutes, in average. So, I mean, clearly that, that is a development that we're going to see. Data, the other big opportunity. If you're investing in, in companies, look for companies who deal with data and figure out what to do with it. It's just as good as oil, but cleaner. Data is, in fact, I call, data is the new oil. You've, I'm sure you heard this before, it's not from me. It's been used many, many times. The European Commissioner of Telecom has said this already in 2009, so if you haven't listened, you know, you hear it from me first. But data is the new oil, and any business model that's based on data, if you do it right, is a trillion dollar business in general. I mean, it's just, it's the oil business, right? Imagine a company orchestrating big data. In the US, companies have figured out they could save $400 billion if they could use data to orchestrate what people are doing. And going back to data and oil, right, this is, of course, the BP disaster. Right? You don't want that to happen with data. So whatever you do in your business, whether you have an existing business or build one, yeah, don't let data flood out. Right? Then you're basically dead. Even though BP has not been killed, which is kind of an interesting angle there. Uh, imagine the total convergence of all the new. Nike has a running shoe connecting to the internet. This is the only thing that keeps Nike interesting. All the shoes are the same. There's a, there's a couple million people you know, sharing their running experience on the internet using this fancy shoe. And that has reinvented Nike. And of course, location that's based on this. The radical conversions of mobile devices and television. That's a very fruitful term. New ways of connecting the cloud and the crowd. So, I mean, there is a huge amount of things that are happening there between what's in the cloud, and it's hardly working now in many ways. It doesn't actually work, right? But when it does work, you know, we're looking at five billion people being connected in this way, and the total reinvention of advertising. I don't know if any of you are in the advertising business, but advertising basically sucks, right? I mean, old advertising, we don't want to see, we don't want to pay attention to it, we hate it. We avoid it. Now advertising has to become good, it has to become meaningful, and we're going to see the shift here, right? The shift from mobile, for example, a lot more people are paying attention to mobile than are advertising on it, and the same goes for print. It's a reverse. Huh? That shift is a $250 billion shift. Advertising is going to follow attention, and attention is going somewhere else. So it's also a great way to innovate and, and go forward. Open systems, right? We're clearly moving towards open platforms. Not to say that closed platforms can't work, they can. I wouldn't try it, but some people do bank on that. I think that walled gardens like Apple and Facebook and you know, Nintendo or whatever was there before that, they can be nice, but will be very difficult to make because basically what they do is they create an economy, not an economy. Right? It's all about themselves. This is why I didn't buy Facebook shares, right? Because it's, it's a walled garden and I, I, I don't think that will, in the long run, pan out. Okay, open systems will win. Uh, exceptions exist. We talked about this. Open is the new captive. You know, when you talk to people about marketing, they say, you know, we have to capture the customer, keep the customer, tie up the customer, retain the customer, like prison. Well, the future of, of, of marketing and advertising is, not, is the opposite. 
about getting people excited about what you're doing. That is the opposite, as open as the new captive. A global culture of API. Systems talking to each other. I mean, actually, in a scary way, also humans talking to systems and vice versa, which will be an interesting discussion about how that will come up. Reaching a global audience by using social, local, mobile. This is possible now for everyone. I mean, you know, I, I get about, I don't know, 50, 60 mails a day from people saying, please, I have a startup. Would you go to our Facebook page and like us? Because they want to use the viral mechanism. Finally, and then I have a summary, then I'm really going to finish, okay? Trust is the new money. It's the only thing we have left to pay with is trust. Because trust can, translates into people saying, you know what, I'm going to buy from you, even if it's more expensive. As long as I can trust you, as long as you're transparent, as long as you're real, as long as you don't take me for a ride and exploit what I'm doing. That goes for governments, that goes for companies, and that goes for individuals. That is the currency of the future. So basically, you know, if you're building a company, that should be sort of the cornerstone there. So summary here, first, let's reimagine what we do. You should spend 3 to 5% of your time on reimagining what your company will look like in three years. If you haven't started one yet, then you should think about what's going to happen in three years, not what's happening today. <coughs> and you have to go where it's going to be, not where it has been. The end of silos. You, you can't just be in the tech business. Now that, that's the past. You're not just in the software business. When you're a software business, you're in the content business. Data is the new oil. That's, if I was to invest in a company, I would look in this direction and say, if you're not really disrupting, and if you're not really creating something that is based on these principles, I wouldn't invest. Very un-German thing to say, right? speed over perfection. This is not true if you make, if you make airplane engines, you know, because it's too dangerous. But in many companies, we have to change the way that we innovate. It has to be much quicker and at lower risk and a lot more of it. I mean, this is really tough for publishers and companies like that to actually innovate quickly without it being perfect. I mean, this is, of course, American principle. But the crowd and the cloud, connecting the crowd and the cloud, there is a trillion dollar business model there in terms of technology, in terms of social connections, in terms of all kinds of revenue streams. Finally, the most important point, disrupt or be disrupted. It's your choice. You can, you can sit there and wait, and then you will be disrupted for sure. There's very few companies that cannot be disrupted by these trends in the next couple of years. Thanks very much. Merci beaucoup. Here are my websites. I have a mobile app you can download. It's $500. No, it's free. Thanks very much for listening. Yeah.